for coming out tonight. Um, just a little more about, my name is Lyle. I work for Screwed and Barley. We're a homebrew supply shop out of South Lyon. Um, I've personally been homebrewing for about 11 years. Um, I've worked for a couple other homebrew shops. Um, we do these classes to try to get people involved in the hobby, answer questions, kind of break down that barrier of, oh, I feel like this might be too much for me. It, it is really a fairly easy process, and I want you to feel comfortable with it. So ask any questions you have throughout the presentation. And you've got the slides there. Um, I gave you a business card so you can check out um, our website online or stop by our business in South Lyon. I know it's on the other side of the big city, but <laughs> but uh, feel free to come out that way. We have a website too. You can check out all this stuff. So um, we have about an hour and a half. It's going to be a little, a little bit tight, but um, we'll try to keep things moving. As, I, as she said, the cameras are on, so um, we'll try to work with that. So to get started, just a little bit of an outline. Just a little bit of outline of what we're going to go over today. First off, answering that question, what makes beer? What makes it beer? What, how do we put together this thing that we want to make? Um, we're going to go over extract brewing today. So I've got our extract beer recipe kit, and we'll go over what's involved in that. Some of the equipment that's involved, and then all the brewing steps. And I'll try to show you as many as I can. Obviously, some of the things that take a little longer during the process I won't be able to show, but we'll go over those. And then finally, some tips on how to make good beer, um, and then how do you get started. So we'll move on right into the mix here. Uh, right, what, exactly what makes beer, grain, yeast, hops, and water. If anybody knows about German pure be beer purity laws, those are the four ingredients. They actually didn't even know about yeast, so <laughs> those are what's involved in the process. Um, we'll go through each one here. Uh, first off with the grain, um, primarily it's barley, but we do have wheat, rye, or oats. Same stuff you make bread out of. Not, but the big difference between making bread and making beer is the malting process. So in this process, what they do is they take the grain kernels, they're going to put them into water like they're going to grow into a plant. Those, those kernels are going to start to unlock all of the good starches that are in that kernel that will help them grow into a plant. And as soon as they start to unlock them and get those enzymes ready to do it, they hit them with, with heat and they kill them to create malted barley. So now they've got the enzymes, they've got the starch, the brewer can take over to make the beer. So that's the big difference between making bread versus making beer. Bread, you would just take the starches that's involved with the grains and immediately make bread. Um, we've got a variety of malts. Uh, character malts go through an additional step where they are steeped in water again and those enzymes will actually convert all those sh starches into sugars within the grain. And then these are kilned at different colors, um, kind of similar to coffee, the way coffee is, um, is roasted. And then that really will develop the flavor notes in the beer, the color of the beer, the body of the beer, things like that. <clears throat> Once these malted, this malted barley is added to water, that is creating wort. Uh, wort is made by steeping these cracked malted grains in water at a very specific temperature range for all these enzymes to work that will convert all these starches into sugar. That sugar will eventually make alcohol. Um, all these different malts are, as I said, will bring fermentables. That's the sugar, body, flavor, and color to the wort. And then the malt extract, which is involved in this extract brewing process, is really taking that wort and making it into an easy, accessible form for people to use. So traditionally, it's either in a thick liquid like this, molasses-like substance, or in a dry powder. So either boiled down or spray dried into a liquid or dry form. So today, and I just want to give you guys a sense of what we're working with, um, I've got a various malts, malted barley here of different kiln levels, different types of malted barley. Um, it's all pretty much two-row barley to start with, but it's all created into different types of malt that we use for making beers. So I'm going to pass these around. You guys can smell and even taste them if you want to take a couple kernels. Um, it's just like eating cereal. So first off, we've got two-row barley. This is a basic uh, malt that's going to be used for making most beer. It's the base for most varieties of beer that you'll see out in the market. Um, use this two-row barley. Very light kiln, 
Um, it's really just there for the starches. Why do they call it two row? It's uh, actually the barley when it grows. Um, there are two kernels in a row versus six row barley has six kernels in a row. This stuff is already cracked? And, uh... That stuff is not cracked yet. So I'm going to pass around a, a sample that's cracked so you can kind of get a, some more of the smells that involve. Um, this next one is Munich malt. It's a similar two row barley, but it goes through a different kilning process to a different level. This is a traditional malt using a lot of German beers, but um, we're using it here in America as well. Um, different level of roast and character to it. You can kind of smell the difference between that one and this one here. Does that start as a two row also? Yeah. I would, all of these malts that you're gonna see today are all started as two row. There are, six row is less common. Um, it was traditionally used for a lot of Pilsner beer just because it has more enzyme to it. But it's most people, the two row grows better, more disease resistant, things like that. So, so those two malts are what we would consider base malts. They create most of the fermentable, the beer, the sugar that's going to be um, used to create the alcohol within the beer. Um, so what would happen with those is we would create or we would boil it down. These malting companies would boil it down or spray dry it and they'd create malt extract. So that, that's what I'm actually going to pass around next. This is liquid malt extract. This has gone through that boiling process to make it into a syrup that you would use in your extract brewing to actually mix in and create beer. And I'll show that later on once we get through in, um, later in the presentation. So these next um, three malts are what we consider character malts, so they bring more aroma, body, flavor to the beer. The percentage that you would use in the beer would be a lot lower because you don't want to overpower the flavor in one direction. Um, the first one we've got here is aromatic malt, and it, it really is true to its name. It's very aromatic. You can get the smell off of that. The second one we have is called biscuit malt. It's kind of in that same range of what its name is. It, it's going to taste or smell like biscuits. Yeah, <laughs> and then the third one is a very common uh, character malt you'll see in a lot of beer recipes, and this is a caramel malt, and it goes by Caramel 60L, and 60L has to do with the roast rating. So you'll get uh, Caramel 10L, 20L, all the way up to 120L, and that really is the color of the, the roast that you're going through. So this, this is a 60 right here, um, used in a lot of beer styles. Um, this has gone through that additional steeping step where the sugars are created in the kernel and that's roasted again. So it creates that caramel note from that ro second roasting. Um, you can smell so that there. The upper range was strongest to darkest. To what? It's color. Yeah, yeah. so, mm -hmm. so 10 out, 10 low, it's low bond is the color rating. So that's um, lighter. That's yes. lighter. Okay. And it goes all the way up to 120 out, which mm -hmm. is the darkest. So if you ever went, if you went to our shop or if you went online, you could see these colors would kind of line up. I can go back to that, that previous slide. We've got a little color wheel here of different malts and how it kind of moves around to the different kilning levels. So if you want to pass those around and then I'll just have you throw them on this cart here at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, the next part of beer is hops. Everybody knows that bitter flavor that's associated with beer. That really comes from the hops. Hops are a cone flower that grows on a perennial vine. Um, you probably could even see them around this area. I know there's a hop farm up near Chelsea that has a big operation um, not far off the main road area there. Um, but these, are, these vines grow throughout the summer to about 20 foot high of these trellises and they create these cone flowers that you can see up in the corner. Uh, that is hops. They're a natural preservative. Um, within the inside of that flower cone are these yellow, what we call lupulin glands, and they are where all that good uh, alpha acid is that helps with the bittering of the beer. So this is a chemical that when you boil it, uh, it will change its structure and actually create bitterness. When it's not boiled, it still has a flavor, but it's not that bitter flavor that you know is associated with beer. The more time we boil it, the more bitterness. 
the less time we boil it, the more flavor and aroma we'll get from the hops. So you can see how you can kind of create a variety of flavors from your recipe depending on the style of hop. Um, some of them have stronger amount of oils versus others, stronger flavors. Some that are more on the citrus uh, range versus a floral, herbal, or earthy note. And you see how you can kind of develop your recipe based on your hops plus the different malts that are available. So most of the time hops for long-term storage, they are pelletized. This little thing that looks like rabbit food here. So they're taken as a cone, they're pressed through a press, and made into these rabbit, uh, these pellets here. And you can smell, uh, you can still smell exactly what's going on with the hops from those pellets. I would recommend eating them. <laughs> it's going to be very bitter. <laughs> um, they do make some hop candies now that you can kind of get a sense of different varieties. Some people make hop teas to get a sense of different hop varieties. Um, those are all options, but it is, it is gonna, it, it is eating a flower. <laughs> so you can know it's gonna be very bitter. Um, so there's a wide variety of, of hops with different flavors, aromas, things like that. Um, next up, next in the process, we've got water. It makes up a majority of the beer. So even though people don't worry about it as much, it really does come into play. Having good, clean water makes good beer. Um, there are a lot of things that you can control, mineral levels, pH, hardness of the water that can all impact the brewing process and how, um, how the hops or the malt can be perceived in the finished product. What I try to recommend for beginners is really just to focus on making sure your, your water is chlorine free. Chlorine can cause some off flavors throughout the brewing process. The yeast can get involved with the chlorine. Um, so it, as, if you've got well water, that's great. Go with that. Um, if you have to buy store-bought water that doesn't have chlorine in it, or you can actually remove the chlorine through filtration or using this stuff we call Camden tablets. And it's a, it's a compound that will neutralize the chlorine and cause it to off-gas off the water. You can do that the night before and, and remove that chlorine from the water. So we're on a well, so we don't get the chlorine, but yeah. uh, it's got a slightly higher salinity level because of the sulfur. Sure. Does the salinity uh, negatively impact the beer all that much? Because you can't taste it. If you can't taste it, you're probably safe. Um, really it's salty. Content, would it affect it more? Well, see, so but then on the sulfur, yeah. we get, it removes the iron. Yeah, you don't, the iron can be a problem with too much. It can cause some off flavors. But if you remove that, um, the salt content, it's, it, it's hard to say. It depends on how hard it is. Um, different styles of beer respond better. Darker beers respond better to hard water because they, the darker grains are more acidic, so it actually kind of neutralizes the hardness. Um, but that has to do with more of like doing an all-grain brewing process where with extract, you're really just steeping the grains out. So, I mean, I, I would say in general, you're probably safe if, if you don't notice any strong off flavors in your water. So, especially as a beginner, I mean, you get start to get accustomed to what you're working with and where you can go with it. And the, the more you get into the hobby, the more you can stress about <laughs> other things, I would say. <laughs> um, and then finally, we've got our yeast. Uh, everybody has probably used yeast in, in baking and things like that. And, the yeast that we work with is going to look and seem very similar. It often comes in dry packets, similar to the yeast that you would use in making bread. Um, but it is different. It is able to convert sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Um, you always hear about the two different types of yeast, ale or, uh, ale or lager, two different types of beer. Um, that really refer refers to the fermentation temperature range for the two different styles. So traditionally, ale is fermented at room temperature around 65 to 75 degrees. The yeast will actually kind of congregate at the top of the fermenter and ferment what we call top fermenting. Lager yeast is a different strain of Saccharomyces, which is um, what brewing yeast is. And that will tend to ferment at a lower temperature from the bottom of the fermenter you're looking at in the, the 50 to 55 degree range is normal for lager yeast. With lager yeast, there are some additional steps usually involved, so it's, it's not something I recommend beginners need to start off right off the bat because temperature control and different steps where you do cold storage really help mold that style of beer. 
So most people start with the ale, with ale uh, strains in making most of their beers. And you can make some of the traditional lagers, lagers out there, Oktoberfest, Pilsner, things like that, with ale strains, fermenting at room temperature. And you, you can get pretty close to what they originally were intended to be. Um, when we first, before we add the yeast, we tend to want to get oxygen into the, into the wort. And what that does is it actually helps the yeast build up their numbers. They're going to multiply, they're going to consume all that oxygen. And then as soon as they finish consuming all the oxygen, they're going to start consuming the sugar and making alcohol. So there's two different stages of the fermentation. Um, that first stage is going to be within the first 12 to 24 hours is consuming all that oxygen and, and clearing that out and then moving on to alcohol fermentation. As I said, it comes, we've got the dry form here, but it also comes in a liquid form. I'll show you some of the packaging later in the presentation. And then the yeast can actually contribute to the flavor of the beer. Not only can it um, accentuate things like hops or malt, but it can also create its own esters or phenols um, that contribute these, these fruit notes or um, spicy notes that you might experience in certain styles of beer. Belgian beer tends to have a lot of yeast character to it. German wheat beer has a lot of yeast character to it. Um, you really get to know what kind of yeast is involved when you get into making some of the different recipes. Other ingredients, you can have other fermentables. Corn, rice, and sugar are all options for fermentables can produce or can provide some of the sugar that you need. Fruits can provide those sugars, but also provide those, those awesome fruit flavors that will pair with certain styles, cherries, blueberries, raspberries. There's even people that use starchy vegetables that will, and will actually use the starch, convert that to sugar, pumpkin, sweet potato, or a couple of things I've seen. Honey is an easy source of sugar. Lots of different spices that we use in brewing. Uh, I've got a bunch of listed there. Botanicals like juniper or heather tips. Coffee, chocolate, all kinds of wood, oak aging, uh, and many more that you can find in different recipes. So you, really the palette there on what you can make with beer is, is amazing. Okay, so what are we looking at when we get an extract beer recipe kit? Um, typically, most kits are gonna be five gallon. You're gonna produce five gallons of beer, which is about two cases of beer, about 48 bottles in the end, um, once you get some losses in some different areas. There are recipe kits that are one gallon kits that um, some places have set up for people that are restricted on you know, the amount of space they have and things like that, or, um, different options out there. And you can really make any amount of beer you want, but I, most of the time when you start out with recipes, it's gonna be in this range. And a lot of them will be what we call a partial boil. So you're not boiling the full five gallons of water. You're only gonna boil about half of it, and then you dilute it with water. So there's some aspects of the process with that partial boil that make it easier because you're not boiling as much, so you don't need as much heat. Um, it's easier to cool that volume, but then you also get some negative things. The color tends to be a little bit darker. It takes a little more hops because the sugar restricts that hop reaction. Um, but all these recipes are going to take those into account. So you, you should be fine with working with the recipes and you can start to expand out and try to modify them into what you want to do. They're going to contain malt extract like I talked about either in liquid or dry form here. Uh, a muslin bag, which is basically a sock that we use to hold the grains in. Um, I'll show you that here in a second once we start the process here. Um, hops, which we've got some vacuum sealed here in a mylar bag. You want to protect them from light and oxygen when they're in that little pellet form. Um, yeast, as I said, dry or liquid. Priming sugar, I'll go into that later when we get into bottling. Um, that's what that's used for. And then bottle caps. We're capping the bottles here at the end. I'll show you that at the, at the end of the process. Um, the steeping grains, uh, here they're uncracked. We would crack them. Uh, most of the time in recipes, when you get them, they'll be cracked. Um, we just keep them uncracked, at least for our, for our store, just to keep them in the most precious state. Once you crack them, they really will start to go bad in a few months. Um, so you want to use that recipe within that first few months, unless they're vacuum sealed or something like that. Um, and then a set of instructions we've got right here, an example for our shop. Um, but a lot, there are a lot of resources online, companies online that are doing this. 
So you can, uh, you can see there will be a little bit of variability, but those are going to be your basic ingredients for getting started with an extract recipe. As far as equipment goes, um, you're going to want to use a nice stainless steel brew pot. Um, for boiling two and a half gallons, I usually recommend four to five gallons for your brew pot, just because you need that extra head space. It's, uh, when the boil starts to occur, there you get a lot of foam going on, and you can get these boil overs, and if you don't have that extra head space, it's going to be hard to control. Um, this is a, a five gallon pot right here. Um, you can see it's got some use on it. Uh, this is stainless steel. The reason I say stainless steel is you just get you get better heat con conductivity from it, but you also it's going to be easier to clean in the end. A thermometer. I've got one right here that it was checking our water with. Um, a fermenter, which is traditionally a six and a half gallon bucket. You can see the graduations on the side. Um, these are food grade buckets. You can buy them as all as part of the kit, or you can buy them individually if you want to. Uh, we're going to go on, we've got an airlock here on the top. That's going to keep oxygen out after fermentation starts. You want it just to keep producing that, that CO2 and alcohol after fermentation really starts kicking. Um, you've got various brushes here, a cardboard brush, a bottle brush. Uh, this is called an auto, auto siphon. I'll show you how to use one later. It's a way of transferring liquid after your, um, after your wort's produced. This is good for easy transfers. You don't want to introduce a lot of oxygen. We've got a brew paddle here, just a plastic food grade paddle. Um, this is what's called a hydrometer. This is for testing the sugar content of the wort once it's produced, and that helps you determine the alcohol content. I'll explain that later, but this will float in the liquid in this test jar, and you can test it before and after the fermentation to figure out how much alcohol you produce. This here is a five gallon carboy. Um, this is not included with most beginner kits, but it's great to have one of these for what we call secondary fermentation, where you want to introduce maybe dry hopping, fruit additions, or let it settle more yeast out before you get into the bottling, just to clear up your beer. Um, we've got a capper here. I'll show you how to kind of use one of those later. Uh, this is a bottling bucket with a spigot here. Um, I'll explain that later, but you've got a bottling wand here for filling your bottles and then capping them so you have your finished product. We've got, uh, at our shop, these are just some prices. You'll see that's pretty consistent throughout most of the homebrew industry. A basic kit that includes everything on, most things on this table except for the brew pot and the carboy runs about $70. A deluxe kit, which usually includes the carboy, is about $120. And then if you get into the what we call a beast kit, which is pretty much everything on this table, including a brew pot, you're in about $150 range. As far as most, I would say most homebrew supply shops are going to be in that range for your beginning equipment when you're getting started. But if you have some of these pieces at home, or you want to piece them together as you go along, <coughs> anything that works for you. Okay, so now we're going into the different extract brewing steps. Um, first off, we want to get all of our equipment together. Um, we're going to move into steeping grains, adding our malt extract. We are producing that wort initially. We're going to then boil it with the hops to get that bittering. After the boil, we want to cool it down to get it ready for adding the yeast to it, transferring it to our fermenter, aerating it with some oxygen to help set up the yeast to, to do their job, pitching the yeast and fermenting it, testing that final gravity at the end just to make sure that the fermentation is done and also give us an idea of what the alcohol content is, and then finally going to bottling using your priming sugar and then letting the beer carbonate before you actually are ready to drink it. So as far as assembling the equipment, we want to check to make sure our equipment is clean and ready to use. Um, one of the things about the brewing process is it kind of works in a quick fashion, so you want to make sure you have everything at your disposal, ready to go. You don't have to clean something that you forgot to clean before. I want to make sure your grains are ready to go in a muslin bag. Uh, we've got them here, our little steeping bag for grains. Um, 
setting out your yeast to, to get them acclimated to the temperature they're going to ferment at, which is usually room temperature. Uh, a lot of times with hops, we add them throughout the brewing process. Today, we're just going to add them at the beginning of the boil, but I'll explain that you can add them later in the boil for different flavor notes. And uh, a lot of times, you want to weigh those out and get them prepped so that way you don't have to worry about it on the fly. Um, if you've got all your extract ready to go, your instructions so that everything's at hand, and you can get started with making beer. So the first step, and I'll show you right up here. You want to bring about two and a half gallons. This is we're assuming a two and a half gallon partial boil recipe, where you're going to make five gallons of beer total. Uh, you're going to want to bring those two and a half gallons of water up to about 150 to 160 degrees. That's that temperature range I'm speaking about where starches will convert to sugars with the enzymes in the malt. For most extract recipes, you're really not trying to achieve that so much. You're really just more of a uh, more dealing with like you're making tea, you're steeping the character and the sugars out of the grains that are already there. So you don't really want, you don't really have to be exact about the temperature, but once you move up past about 170 degrees, you start to get some off flavors from the grains, some of the tannins from the husks and things like that. So it's always good to try to stick within a certain range. You don't have to maintain that range throughout the entire time frame. Usually if you get it up to about 155 to 160 degrees and you let the pot sit, it's not gonna lose temperature that quickly over half an hour. So, so you don't have to worry about adding heat if you don't want to. So that's what I've got over here. Now today, just in the interest of time, we're just doing a one gallon uh, wort right here. I've got a one, uh, one gallon of water here that I've got up to temperature. Let me just check that real quick. So we're going to add our grains to this. I'm just going to steep for about 10 minutes just to show you what it produces. You can come up and kind of see how the, uh, the water is starting to be produced once we get to that stage. But you really is, it is just like making tea. You're just adding that that bag right into the grain, into the water there, and then dipping it up and down a little bit, and then getting it in there and closing the lid. You don't want the heat on or anything. You don't want to scorch the heat, the bag to the bottom of the pot or anything. Um, I'll pass around. This is the. These are the cracked grains, kind of in the same ratio as what I've got there in the bag. You can smell how the different flavors come together. And we'll be able to, you'll be able to come up here and walk and see uh, what is produced at the end of the steaming stage. So if you're if you're using a uh, propane burner, sure, yeah, you get your water temperature up to 150, 160 degrees. Mm -hmm. You actually turned off the then steep your grains with it off. Yes, I would recommend that because um, any heat at the bottom there can cause a scorch of the grains or the bag to the bottom. Um, you really, it's not even if you lose maybe five degrees temperature, you're still getting the steaming that you want. It's not really critical to have it at a certain temperature. Now with other styles of brewing, where we actually start with just the grains and we're not using malt extract, temperature is a lot more important. So that's where you would want to really focus on making sure the temperature is very consistent. So, but with extract brewing, you have a lot of forgiving uh, nature to it. So. So we're going to let this steep uh, about 10 minutes here. Um, just have a drink of water here. Uh, we're going to move on and start talking about some of the other steps, and then we'll go back to this here in a second. Once it's done steeping, we really just want to lift it out, let it drain. We don't want to squeeze it. We don't want to try to whatever's residual that's attached to the grain. We don't want to try to squeeze that out because all that that husk material can produce some of those tannins that we're talking about, some of the off flavors. Um, as I said, keeping it under 170 degrees to avoid that. I, I talk about this example about one of the, my friends who was getting into brewing. Um, they were trying to follow the recipe and they, they kind of got their water up too hot, almost to a boil, added their grains. And then they went through the entire brewing process and at the end, the end they were tasting their beer and they're like, it's, it's off. There's something just kind of a, Astringent about it, and what it was is what those tannins. It'll really create like a, a dry sensation in the back of your throat. If you've ever had wine that has a lot of tannins, you'll know what I'm talking about. 
but it really does create an off flavor that's, that doesn't make your beer what you're expecting it to be. Um, so as I said, you're just going to let it, you're going to dip it, pull it up, let it drip, discard it after that, and then we'll move on to our next step, which would be adding the malt extract. Um, you really want to keep the heat off still when you're adding the malt extract. Some people try to shorten the process, turn the heat on, and start mixing in with the malt extract. It's, you know, it's one of those things where you can do, but you really have to be making sure you're constantly stirring. Um, this is a thick liquid that can pull, easily pour towards the bottom of the pot, and you can scorch at the bottom of the pot. Um, the same thing with the dry powder. It really will suck in whatever moisture is around and make these clumps that can sink to the bottom. So I usually recommend just keeping that heat off, slowly adding in your malt extract until it's nice and mixed in and you can then start to heat it up to a boil. Um, so once you've dissolved your malt extract, you want to bring that wort up to a boil. We're going to boil it with the hops um, to create that bitterness, but we're also boiling the sugars to create some caramelization reactions that will actually create flavors within the beer as well. So those are all occurring within the boil. Um, you're also getting various proteins that are involved with both the hops and the grain, and those are coagulating together and dropping out. Um, if you've ever boil, when you boil potatoes, you know how it really foams up initially once it gets to a boil. Very similar when you're making beer. That foam is very stable because of all the proteins that are involved in that, that barley and the malt extract. And as those proteins start to coagulate and break down, that foam kind of breaks up. And you, you see that when you're making potatoes. Eventually the boil kind of breaks up and all that foam starts to subside. Um, that's the same thing you would see with beer making. And I'll try to, hopefully we'll be able to see some of that um, today once we get this up to a boil. So when you're doing that, as I said, you really want to avoid that boil over. That foam will build up quickly. It's one of those things you definitely want to be watching when you're doing it. You want to adjust the heat, turn it down as needed, because if you've ever made something on the stove and had it boil over or something, you know how bad that can be. It's even worse with this stuff. This is, this is a lot of sugar. If it boils over, it will stick to everything and it'll turn black and dark and nasty and really ruin a stove. It's great to have a propane burner outside to avoid those types of messes, but um, really watching the heat as it's starting to boil, and then that first five, ten minutes just kind of making sure that it's not going to boil over, and then you can really just let it do its thing. When you, um, when you start to do the boil, yeah. you said you're, you're adding your malt extract while the heat is off. You start your, start your heat process back up again. Yes. Yeah. A lot of these extract kits have you know 60 minute boils things like that. Do you mm -hmm. do you time it from the time you turn the heat on, or the time it hits boil temperature, and then you start start timing? It? So the time really has to do with boiling the hops. So most people will add their hops once it gets to a boil. Okay. So that's really what what you're going to want to do is as soon as it gets to a boil, start your timer. Um, the hops are really determining most of the schedule. Um, you'll see boil times that will be less too. Um, some recipes can take 30 minute, 45 minute boils. It really depends on what they, how they design the recipe. Um, shorter boil times can create less color change. So you're not getting as many of the color mobilization reactions. So your color's not getting as dark. Um, some recipes, and it's becoming a bigger trend, you'll actually add some of your extract right before your boil. And then you'll add some of it at the very end of your boil. And the rationale there is that because you've got such concentrated sugars at the beginning, by taking some of those sugars and waiting and putting them at the end, you don't get as dark of a wort. You don't get that as caramel flavor from the wort. So it's really a way of trying to reduce that reaction, I guess you would say. Um, that's becoming a big trend. So you really you have to look at your recipe and see where that is. If you do have a late ex extract addition like that, I would recommend turning the heat off at that point, stirring it in, and then resuming the boil once it once the boil gets back kicking. So um, it really comes down to how they design the recipe. So um, I, I recommend looking at that. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of manipulate what you're going to produce um, with.
with, with extract brewing. So, so as I said, you want to knock down the foam either by stirring, some people use a spray bottle, and what's happening there is that the proteins in the foam are coagulating and they're, they're dropping into the liquid, and eventually after the boil, you'll be able to see this later, they all kind of collect at the bottom with all the hot material. And we'll try, to, we'll try to get the work off of that at the very end. Let's see where we're at here with the steeping. It's been about six minutes or so. What I'll have everybody do if they want to kind of get a smell of what we're developing up here if you want to walk by. I know we've got the camera on, but we can people can come on up and kind of see some of the color that's developing in the liquid. Some of the smells, it does smell really good. <laughs> yeah, it's a good smell. Yeah, if you're making, will will really smell, make a uh, house smell good, in my opinion. Even after you add the hops, some people don't like the smell once you add the hops. But um, if you, yeah, exactly. if you've ever driven by a brewery, we have many local ones here. You can, you can, if you notice this type of smell, that they're brewing that day. So, um, what I'm going to do, and just in the interest of time, is we're going to move on to adding the malt extract. So I'm going to lift this out, just let it drain a little bit here. And as you, any of the people that came up, you can see that the color is developing, the smells, the nice good aromatic smells that were coming from those different grains that we all um, were able to check out earlier. So I'll throw this here in the garbage. And then we've got malt extract here today in the liquid form. So what I'm gonna do is just start mixing it in, pouring it slowly. And it's just like mixing in uh, a baking mix or molasses or something like that. You're just mixing it around, making sure that it's not getting all stuck at the bottom. As I said, the dry powder will stick to everything, so pour slowly. It will really clump at the top. Um, as far as some of the other fermentables that we were talking about, honey and things like that, some recipes might have you add honey at this time or it might have you add it near the very end of the boil. Um, I just recommend following the recipe and then once you get used to the different recipes, you can start to experiment with different things that you can do to create your own. You talked earlier about uh, making sure everything's clean. Yes. It seems if you're boiling it, it doesn't have to be sterile, but how clean you just want it free of, yeah, anything that's going to be in contact with before the boil, you just want it free of like any, you know, stuff stuck to it or anything like that. Anything that's going to be after the boil, you want it fairly clean. It doesn't have to be like super sanitary. We actually are going to use sanitizers on all of our equipment that's going to come into contact after the boil. And I'll explain that here in a second. But um, anything that's going to be right before the boil, I mean, just a good rinse off, make sure there's nothing stuck to it, You're, you should be okay. Because you are, as you said, you are boiling it, so that's really sanitizing the wort. But once we get rid of the, once we're done with the boil, our fermenter, any, um, like our paddle, at that stage, we want to be able to make sure that we can sanitize it. If there's a lot of stuff that's stuck to it, it doesn't stand, sanitize well. If it's not cleaned off well, it's not going to sanitize well. So, we're good right there. I didn't take all of it with there, but we're just kind of making some work today. Um, so, now what I'm going to do is turn back on the heat. and we'll bring this up to a boil. This is going to take a few minutes uh, with this induction heater here. So, um, just get an opportunity to throw a couple things, things away here. I would recommend leaving the lid off. You know, if, if your stove does have a hard time getting two and a half gallons to boil, you can have the lid on. 
just a little bit off like that. Um, you just want to be able to be able to see down in there, see what's going on. If you leave, leave it shut like that, there's a very good chance you get it boil over because <laughs> that foam will really stabilize in the center. Okay, so. Sorry about that. So we've added our malt extract. We're bringing that to a boil now. Once you get it up to a roiling boil, once it's fairly stable boil, that's the point where I would, we would go ahead and add your hops. Um, we keep it at a boil for a certain amount of time. Most of the time that's 60 minutes. And that has to do with that, that reaction where the hops change their structure and create bittering. Um, bitterness within the, the wort. This is going to be, most of your hop schedules that you see in recipes are going to be based off of the amount of time left in the boil. So with 60 minutes left, we add what we call our bittering hops. Those are the ones that are going to produce that bitterness. We have other additions later in the process, either usually at like 15 minutes left or 5 minutes left, that give you flavor or aroma from the hops. And that gives you an um, the good smells that you can get off the beer from the hops. Um, you can get some flavor notes. It's, it's similar to like when you're steeping tea, once again, with adding them that late in the boil. And then you can even add, add hops after the boil's done at, at flame out, or even once it's been fermented. So anytime you see a beer that's called dry hopped, they usually add those hops after the initial fermentation is done. And what they're doing with that is they're actually preserving all the oils from the hops and not really getting any bitterness. So you're getting all those good flavors and aromas from the hops without getting the bitterness that you would get from boiling them. This is a great time while well, the, the word is boiling to sanitize your equipment that is going to be needed for fermentation. So your bucket, your airlock, anything that's going to touch the wort after the boil, you want to make sure to sanitize. If you're going to have to stir it around with your paddle, you want to sanitize that um, at, before you actually put it into the wort. So today I've got just a small two-gallon fermenter to transfer our one-gallon boil into. I've got a smaller version of an auto siphon. I'll be able to show you how to use that in a little bit. And then one of the most popular sanitizers that you'll see with most home brewing kits is what's called Easy Clean or One Step. It's a white powder. You mix a tablespoon per gallon of water. Um, there are a lot of other options that you can get in kits, but I would say for most beginners, you'll start with something like this. And they all have their pros and cons. Easy Clean is nice because it's, you don't have to, with all sanitizers, they're gonna be called what's called a no rinse sanitizer. You're not gonna, once you actually apply them to the equipment, you don't wanna rinse them off with water because water could potentially have bacteria in it, the sanitizer will remove any bacteria um, and get it ready for fermentation, so you're not going to produce any off flavors from bacteria getting into your work. So we're just going to mix that up real quick, and then I'm going to pour some into my fermenting bucket. Usually works best with warm water but we'll take what we got here. So I'm gonna pour some of this into here, about half of it. Leave half of it behind. We can sanitize our auto siphon with the other half. Just kind of work it into the tubing. Um, this takes a little bit of contact time for easy clean in one step. So you want to keep that liquid in contact with all the surfaces for a few minutes. Um, with the bucket, what I usually recommend is closing the bucket lid and 
then working it around on all the surfaces. So I'm just kind of shaking it around, getting all the surfaces, touching with the, with the sanitizer, pouring some through the auto siphon, or through the airlock, I mean, I'm sorry. And then I'll usually do that a couple times over a few minute period just to make, all sh make sure all those services get in contact with the sanitizer. I've got a little measuring cup here that I'm going to take a sample later and show you a hydrometer reading, so I'll throw that in the sanitizer. And that's pretty much most of the things that I'll need as far as post oil for getting ready for fermentation. Um, as far as what you got over here within a normal kit, um, your hydrometer, as long as you take that sample and put it into the hydrometer test jar separate from your what's in your fermenter, you can leave that unsanitized. Some people like to put that hydrometer right into their bucket. You'd want to sanitize the hydrometer if that's the case. Just anything that's going to come into contact with your wort that's going to be in your fermenter, you want to make sure it's sanitized. So let's see where we're at. We are starting the get signs of a boil here. Turn this up for a second. So hopefully once we get to a boil, I'll have you guys come up and kind of see where we're at. See that, what I was talking about with that foam coming up. With malt extract, um, because it's been boiled one time, the foam won't be as intense. I tend to find the foam to be more intense with the dry stuff. Um, with what we were talking about before with all grain brewing, because you're using malted barley for the whole portion, it has more protein involved and you're going to see a more intense foaming from that stuff. So, once, we're gonna, once we get this boil up to, um, to a full boil, we'll start our timer. I'm just going to boil for about 10 minutes just to um, show you the process, see, what, see what's involved. You'll be able to see at the end of the boil, all this stuff will start to come to the bottom of the water, and we're going to actually try to remove that um, from our what's going to go into our fermenter. The hot material, things like that, we don't want that to go into our fermenter. The longer it's in contact with the water, some of the off flavors can come from it. We really just were able to get all the bittering units from it from the boil. We can leave it behind after that. Um, once we get to the cooling stage, Really, the goal is to prep it for adding yeast. Uh, yeast like to ferment, as I said, around room temperature. So you want to get it down to that temperature as quick as you can. Um, there are off flavors that can be produced if you leave it at a warmer temperature. There's some chemicals involved with the malt that can create off flavors, um, like cooked corn is one of the ones they talked about, if, if you leave it at that above 100 degrees for an extended period of time. Now an extended period of time is like more than an hour at over 100 degrees. So as I said, that's one of the reasons why a lot of these recipes are partial boil is because you only will have to cool those two and a half gallons. You can do it pretty quickly in an ice bath, which is what we're gonna do today. I've got some ice set up in this bucket here. If you are using a larger amount of wort, something like a wort chiller would be a great option. That would go inside of your wort and run cold water through the coil, and that would help chill it quicker than an ice bath would. Still getting up there. So, as I said, getting it below 100 degrees to, off, to, to eliminate those off flavors, but then once you're trying to get it down to your actual fermentation temperature, you've got some more time that you can to, to work with that. So, a lot of people love to brew during the summer. It can be very difficult to get your work all the way to 70 degrees when you're running water through a hose or, um, you know, or you're outside and the temperature's 80, 90 degrees. But as long as you got it under that 100, you can bring that fermenter inside, put it into a cold water bath or something like that, and you can have several hours to get it all the way down to the, to the pitching temperature around 70 degrees. Um, as I said, most beginners will start with putting their brew pot into an ice bath. Um, some more ingenious ones will actually, because you're going to be diluting the wort with water, you can take some of that dilution water and chill that down 
maybe in your fridge, like you've got a gallon jug of water or something. And then once you add that to the wart, that'll instantly chill. So that's a great option for people that, um, that don't want to have to deal with an ice bath for an extended period of time. And I said the wart chiller can handle what we call a full boil, where you're boiling the full five gallons. A wart chiller will work great. You can get it down to that 70 degrees, usually in about 20 minutes to a half an hour, that full five gallons. Okay, if you guys want to make your way up here, we're gonna, about to get to the boiling stage right here. You can start to see some of the foam that's developing at the top. And it's not gonna be as intense on this induction burner, but um, you can see some of that stuff starting to billow up. Um, and we'll get that, that, that boiling going here in a second. It'll, it kind of likes to break, what I call a breakthrough. Um, you'll tend to get a layer of like a consistent foam on the entire top and then one little spot will kind of break through. You can see it on this picture from the previous slide. Down here in the corner, see how it kind of broke through on the one side and then the foam kind of all situated itself on the other side.
Uh, that's all you're using for two and a half gallons? This is just going to be a one gallon batch. Um, for most five gallon batches, you're going to, depending on the strength of the hops, the amount of alpha acids in that variety of hops, you're probably looking at an ounce to two ounces for your bittering. So for this only being a gallon, we're at about a fifth of that. So we're only using about 0.2 ounces just to keep consistent with what the recipe is. So. But it, as I said, depending on the bitterness that you want in the beer, the recipe that you're working with, you can end up using more or less hops. Um, but each variety of hops is going to have different amount of bittering capabilities, the alpha acid units. Um, and those are really going to be dictated most of the time by your recipe. If you if you build brewing a, a larger volume, do you put your hops in a, in a muslin bag at all, or do you not bother? Personally, I keep them loose. There are a lot of people that use muslin bags to keep the hops together. Just it helps them with cleanup at the end. Um, I say to each their own on that. Um, the only rationale for not doing it in the bag is that you want the hops to spread out as much as possible, but most of the time if you tie the bag at the very top, they'll spread out enough anyways. Um, it really does help kind of consolidate them at the bottom of the brew pot at the end. You guys will be able to see the difference um, here once I get done cooling this water on what gets settled all down to the bottom, all that hot material and everything. So, so yeah, well, it looks like we're finally up to a full boil here. Nice consistent boil going on. You want a good rolling boil to keep those hops moving. You don't want them sitting at the bottom of the of the kettle because that'll potentially scorch to the bottom. So we'll let that boil for about another eight minutes or so. Um, move back to the slide we were on. So once we got to the cooling stage. We're going to cool that down real quick, and then we want to move that wort over into our fermenter. So there are a lot of schools of thought on this. Um, really, the goal is you want to leave behind the hot material. The proteins and things like that are not as critical. They can affect the clarity of the beer long term, but you're really looking to keep that hot material out. Um, two schools of thought using an auto siphon to actually siphon off of all that hot material and transfer it into your bucket. But a lot of people like to actually pour their wort. You're already going to add oxygen before you add your yeast, so pouring it through a strainer just does some of that aeration anyways. So people, you'll see this little picture down in the bottom where somebody's poured through a strainer and it's held back a lot of that hot material. I find the auto siphon is going to give you the cleanest wort in your fermenter, but once your fermentation occurs, anything that's in there is going to settle to the bottom. That, you know, any leftover hot material protein is all going to settle to the bottom. So you'll be able to get, it, get the beer off of it eventually anyways. Um, it really just depends on how you want to do your process. Once you've got it into your fermenter, you're then going to want to dilute it up to your volume. Um, this is where you can use the, the hash marks on the side. Um, as I said, you're boil usually boiling about two and a half gallons. You're going to lose a little bit of water from the boil. So you may be only going to end up with about two gallons that get over into your, your fermenter and then you're going to dilute it up. When you do that dilution, you can do measurements with your hydrometer to make sure you're diluting to a specific amount of sugar or you can just dilute it up with your, like your recipe will, uh, will call for. Most of the time, when we develop recipes for our shop, we try to account to account for some of that wort that you're going to lose from the kettle because some of it's not going to go over into the into the bucket. So we try to take that into account so that way when you dilute up, you're going to still hit your level of sugar that you want to get your certain alcohol content. So once you've got it diluted up. This is where you want to check what we call specific gravity of the wort. And this is a measure of the density of it. It tells you how much sugar is in the wort. And this is where we use our hydrometer. By taking a reading before fermentation and after fermentation, the difference between those true readings will tell you how much alcohol you produced. Um, when I say specific gravity, what that is, it's a density of that 
compared to the density of water. So usually these densities are going to run for a starting gravity, is going to run in the range of about 1.040 to about 1.080. So you can see the density of water would be 1 when it's a 1 to 1, and then anything above that means that it's more dense than water. As the sugar gets consumed and alcohol is produced, that number starts to go down. So the, initially the hydrometer will flow higher, and then it will start to flow lower. That difference will allow you to calculate how much alcohol is involved. Most recipes will have that little calculation that you can do. A lot of hydrometers also have our, what we call a triple scale hydrometer. So one of the scales is potential alcohol. So what you can do is when it's floating higher, maybe it's up right here at about 7% potential alcohol. And then once it's done fermenting, say it's down here at about 2% potential alcohol, just take the difference. 7 minus 2 is 5% alcohol. So that's an easy scale that you use if you don't want to deal with the calculation. This really will, not everybody likes to do this reading. Some people just go by the recipe and what's made is made. It's got alcohol in it. That's fine. <laughs> and that's fine. And that's one of the aspects of home, that's great about home brewing is you really do as much as you want to do and as little as you want to do. So as much as you're interested about it versus as, as little as you um, as long as you're making what you're interested in, then I say go with your process. Um, as I said, higher gravity means more sugar, which ultimately means more alcohol. And then once you've got it into your fermenter, you've got your gravity check, you're ready to put in your yeast, you really want to aerate that wort, add a little bit of oxygen to help your yeast get going initially. Um, that can be done by stirring aggressively or introducing air through like a diffusion stone. So if anybody's had an aquarium with a diffusion stone, it's like a little bubbler stone that it'll in insert uh, oxygen that way. And so um, there are a lot of homebrewers that have a little aquarium pump hooked up to a tubing, to a diffusion stone, you just stick it down in your work, you kind of let it go for about 10, 15 minutes. It'll produce a lot of foam, but all that oxygen starts to get into your work. Um, some people will even use pure oxygen. You don't have to do it for as long, usually less than a minute, about half, about 30 seconds to a minute. Um, but to each their own, how, whatever you want to, are willing to um, do for your process. Some people really want to get it done and get it, <laughs> get it pitched with uh, their yeast. So, let's see where we're at over here. So uh, hopefully once we get this cooled down, I'll, I'll give you a demonstration on that hydrometer reading for our, what we call our original gravity. And then what you would have at the end of your fermentation is your final gravity. So we got it aerated, we got it in our bucket, ready to go. We're ready to pitch our yeast. Um, as I said, there's liquid and dry forms. These pictures down at the bottom show you many of the, the most of the premier yeast suppliers for home brewers. We've got um, our dry yeast here at the end, White Labs yeast in the middle there, and then Y yeast is another option. There are a lot of yeast companies that are developing. Home brewing is very popular. Microbreweries are very popular. All these companies service home brewers or microbreweries. So there are a lot of yeast strains that are becoming available. Um, for liquid yeast, you really want to use the direction, follow the directions on the package, um, whether it has like a, an activator pack in it, or it, it recommends to sanitize the packaging, things like that. Um, dry yeast can be sprinkled onto the wort, so you can literally sprinkle it onto the very top of your fermenter, or you can rehydrate it in some warm water that's been boiled. You want to make sure the water's sanitized. Um, either way, it'll work. The hydration really just gives it an extra chance to, to get back to liquid form before you introduce it to the, all the sugars in the wort. Once it's had a chance to hydrate in that wort for a little bit or in that water, you want to give it a stir with a sanitized spoon just to mix it in. And then you can get it into your wort, seal the fermenter, and then you want to add some kind of liquid to your airlock. So usually I add some sanitizer. Um, I'll show you here in a second once we get to that stage. But um, the airlock is just going to prevent 
oxygen and outside air from getting into the fermenter. You're going to see bubbles that are start to come out of it as the fermentation starts to get going, and that can give you an indication of how your fermentation is going along. The, you'll see a high bubble rate initially, and then it'll start to slow down. It'll get to the point where it pretty much stops. Um, as long as your fermenter is sealed, you'll be able to see those bubbles, and that's a good indicator of where your fermentation is going. I think we've gotten our wort pretty much boiled down now, so I'm going to give it a little bit of a stir, just make sure things mixed up here. Turn this off. So before I put this in to our ice bath, I just want to seal up the lid, keep that outside air. Any uh, bacteria in the outside air, just keep that out of our brew pot. Put this in here. For, you know, as I said, usually it takes about a half an hour. For this, because it's ice in there, we probably would be probably pretty quick. Um, we just want to cool it enough to be able to transfer it over. Uh, I've got my fermenter pretty much all sanitized here, on my auto siphon. So I'm going to pour out the sanitizer out of this. So as I said, we've got our, as far as our slides go, we've got our yeast now pitched into our fermenter. Um, it's going to start fermenting, and usually that first fermentation takes approximately a week to two weeks for a healthy fermentation. It really depends on the amount of sugar, um, the amount of alcohol that's being produced is going to usually determine the amount of time for that fermentation. Certain strains are maybe a little bit slower than others. But in general, that one to two weeks time frame is what you're going to be looking at. Um, you can actually monitor that progress by the bubbling out of the airlock. Um, as I said, making sure your fermenter is sealed. Once your bubbling starts to slow down, where maybe it's only less than five bubbles a minute, you're probably in that final stages of your fermentation. Um, the best thing to do to make sure you're completely done fermenting is check the gravity. So what, what's always recommended is take a, take a sample, you're going to have to sanitize your whatever you're going to do to sample your wort in your fermenter. Take a sample, measure your gravity, give it a couple days, measure it again. If it's completely stable, your fermentation is probably done. The important thing here is making sure it's completely fermented because any extra sugar that's left behind that doesn't get fermented by the initial fermentation will add to what's going to be produced during the carbonation. So if you have a significant amount of sugar left before you carbonate and then you add sugar to carbonate, you're going to produce a lot of extra carbonation to the point where you might actually break bottles or you might have one that when as soon as you open it, it just gushes out or you can't control the foam that's coming out and you lose all the beer you just made. So it's really good to make sure that fermentation is completely done. Now, I will admit, um, once you get used to the way fermentation goes and you've kind of seen it a lot of times, you don't have to do all the steps. <laughs> I mean, I personally don't check the final gravity multiple times um, just because I am able to visually see and I just know from what I've seen before. Um, but I, that's going to be your truest test because it can fool you sometimes. Sometimes it can seem like it's done, but it can take extra time. You know, it can look like it's completely done. But, uh, so the gravity is really going to be the final determination. Um, once you get to that point where the fermentation is pretty much done, you can get ready to bottle the beer. Uh, you can also do additional steps, like a secondary fermentation. That's what the glass carboy is traditionally used for. You would move the beer from here into the glass carboy. Once it's moved over there, you want to really limit the headspace. Um, oxygen is not good for the beer once it's been fermented. It produces off flavors, it stales the beer. It's great for the yeast before it ferments. They like to build up the numbers, but as soon as they produce the alcohol, that will cause staling reactions with the, with the beer. So when you make transfers between all your containers after the fermentation done, is done, you really want to make gentle transfers. So that's why we've got our auto siphon 
you can put this down in the bucket, start your siphon, siphon to the bottom of the fermenter so it's gently filling it and not creating a lot of foam and aerating it. Um, with the secondary fermentation, you want to limit the headspace because anything above the beer is going to have some oxygen in it. So you would limit that, put your airlock back in, and then you would be able to do, it would either settle more yeast out, or you could do things like dry hopping or adding fruit in that stage to, to add those flavors after the fermentation. So traditionally, most people will add these things after the fermentation because they're trying to preserve the aromas and things in those, those items, either dry hopping or fruit. So the rationale there is that when fermentation is going on, CO2, CO2 is being produced, you're seeing it coming out of your airlock, it is scrubbing aromas out of your beer. So any hops and things like that that you've added late in the boil, some of those aromas and flavors can be scrubbed out from that CO2 that's coming off. So by adding the, the fruit or the dry hop after that fermentation is done, it will preserve some of those oils, aromas, and things like that that you would lose from having them in the fermenter initially. Um, yes? How do you sterilize the fruit or the hops? That's a good right. question. <laughs> so hops are naturally a preservative, so you don't really need to sterilize them. The oils on the surface prevent any bacteria. Those are safe. What I would say with fruit is that you're always going to have a gamble with depending on where your fruit comes from. It's, if it comes from a field and you hand-picked it, um, I would recommend washing it well. You can't, you can't really sanitize it because you're going to lose some of the flavors from the fruit. Yeah, and you don't want to cook it because you're going to lose flavors as well. Once you get to that secondary stage, alcohol is present in the beer. So any minute amount of bacteria can get neutralized by the alcohol. What about camping tablets? Camping tablets are good, yes. They will kill wild yeast. So. It has to be a day before or two days? Usually about 24 hours before. Before you put it in there. Yeah, so if, I, if I'm ever going to use fruit in like a juice form, uh, I made a series of beers recently with a passion fruit juice, and I applied camden tablets to those to help kill the wild yeast. So that is an option for people that want to do that. Um, I do recommend if you're going to use whole fruit to actually freeze them before you are going to add them. Freeze them and then thaw them and smash them up. The rationale behind that is that the freeze cycle will actually break up some of the cell walls within the fruit and help release some of that flavor that's tied up in the fruit. So um, just something like if if you're considering fruit and you've already got a frozen variety you can good, get from a good source, go with it. Because I, I do recommend that as a way to really help unlock some of the flavors from the fruit that you have. You have so. I've read some people will take fruit and soak it in vodka. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's a similar rationale of the surface is going to have any bacteria on it. So this, the vodka will actually um, kill anything on the surface. I've not really done that with fruit. I have done that with botanicals yeah. and, um, and some spices. And I guess part of what, I, what I'm doing with that is actually extracting some of the, the flavors from those as well. Because most flavor compounds are, are going to be more soluble in an alcohol versus water. So by putting them in alcohol, you can do it help get some of that extraction before you actually put it in with something that's majority water. So um, that is a great option for, I, I call it in a vodka extraction. Usually vodka is the best thing to use. Um, it'll extract, extract some of the flavors, and I tend to even add the whole thing after that. But some people might just add what's extracted into the vodka. So there are a lot of options, um, and, and a lot of these recipes will have different ways of doing it. Um, but you are very correct about the fruit. Uh, you really, a lot of times when you add things late in the process, you're, gonna, you're taking a gamble. But one of the things that I like to remind everybody about beer is that because once, once it's produced, the wort is produced, the pH is low enough, and once the alcohol produced is there, nothing will grow that will make you sick. It will just change the flavor of the beer. So there are plenty of beers out there, like sour beers, that you want the bacteria to get into the beer. So anything that will grow in the beer, um, once it, that pH has been lowered, 
you're safe. It's not going to be something like spoiled milk or spoiled cheese or something like that. You really are safe from getting, you know, food poisoning or something. It's really just going to taste different. <laughs> you are just getting, uh, you're going to produce sour notes. You might get bacteria in your equipment. You might have to replace some of your rubber or plastic equipment that gets uh, contaminated with bacteria. Um, but that's about all that's going to happen with your gear. It's just not going to taste exactly the way you want it to. Okay, so I think we got that cooled down enough, hopefully. fermenter ready to go here and then I'm going to just bring this up here set it on here for a second and I've got my auto siphon that I've gotten sanitized here and the, really the goal here is just to whatever surfaces that come into contact you just want to keep them from contacting any dir dirty surfaces Set this up here, lid off, and then it's just an easy one motion to get the siphon started. Don't want to spray it everywhere. It's got a check valve at the very bottom that keeps the wort, uh, that create, helps create that siphon, and you're just moving the wort over. And what I want to do is be able to show you guys what's, what's left behind there at the bottom. So I'm going to do a little bit of siphoning and then I'll probably just pour the rest and you guys can get an idea of what's left behind. So you're saying as long as you siphon it off from the top, it does just as good as uh, running it through a uh, sieve? Yeah, exactly. It really to each their own. Um, with running through a sieve, you're going to get more protein material getting into your fermenter. So long term, there's potential for clarity issues, but um, in general, you're, you're going to be safe. It'll, it'll settle to the bottom of the fermenter, whatever comes over. And when, it, when you're doing the cooling, you tend to get, it tends to, um, you get layers of sedimentation. So you get initially, you're going to have very clear work at the top. And then you have an area that's kind of cloudy from some of the wort um, and proteins that are there. And then you get the heavy hot material at the bottom. At the bottom. So right now I'm just going to pour this out, what's left here. Just trying to keep as much hot material out. I've got some protein material coming in. You guys can kind of see walk this around so everybody can see that really thick hot, hot material is what you're trying to avoid there at the bottom. You can see that really thick hot material there at the bottom is what you're trying to avoid. So what will happen is if any of that stuff gets over your fermenter, it'll sit with your work at the very end. You can see. Um, It'll sit with the, the wort throughout your fermentation, and so you can get some of the more extraction of some of the, like what I call grassy notes from the hops, because it is, it is a plant, so it has all these like leaves and things like that, and you don't necessarily want all of that in your finished product. So by removing that, you're helping to avoid that in the long run. So we've got our wort set up in here. As I said, their next step, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I get to show them too many things here. We are just about done. Of course, it switch on. Oh, no, no. 
We may have to go off, off the slides. I'm sorry about that. It looked like it logged out on the computer on me. <laughs> really sorry about that. Um, but we are really close to the end. So we were pitching our yeast. Um, number seven is where we were at with the, uh, the slides. Uh, and we, we would do that now. We would sprinkle it onto our wort. Um, then once it's hydrated a little bit, we would mix it in, seal up our fermenter. We would clamp it all down, and then we would add a little bit of liquid to our airlock here on the top. This is after you add the additional water to... Yes. Yeah, after you've diluted it, um, you want to dilute before you add your yeast. So, uh, as I said, we've already talked about number eight, which was using the glass carboy or doing testing your final fermentation. The last couple steps are getting it into the bottle. So, um, quickly before we move into that, let me pour a little bit of wort in this, show you a hydrometer reading. <coughs> For a hydrometer reading, you're just going to fill it enough so that way this floats inside. You can see it's not hitting the bottom there. And you're really reading where that liquid level is. So there are a couple options. I said potential alcohol scale is one of them. The other one is the specific gravity, which is going to be that 1.0 or something. Um, you're going to want to take that reading before and after the fermentation to calculate your alcohol. So. We've got that there. Once we've got all of our fermentation done, test our gravity, figure out our alcohol content, the beer's ready to go, we're ready to move it into the bottling stage. Um, for that, we're going to add some sugar back in. The yeast that's left behind in the beer is going to take that sugar and produce carbonation. The amount of alcohol that gets produced at that stage is very minimal. You're really just adding mostly carbonation. That's where our priming sugar comes into play. I recommend boiling that with a cup, a cup to two cups of water. Boil it for five minutes just to sanitize it, then cool it down. Keep the lid on the pot while it cools. Then you're going to add it in with your liquid, with your wort, into the, into the bottling bucket. So what I like to do personally is add it at the bottom of the bucket and then transfer my wort into the top because it helps mix it around. You really want to make sure that sugar gets mixed around appropriately. Because if you get it concentrated in certain bottles, once again, certain bottles can get overcarbonated versus others. Um, and you want to transfer that gently over to your bottling bucket. You don't want to introduce any oxygen. It'll help stay over here. Once you go to fill your bottles, we've got our bottling wand here. This just attaches to the spigot here. You usually want a tight seal. And this bottling wand has a check valve in it. What you're going to want to do is have that bottling bucket higher than your bottle. You're going to push it down into the bottom of the bottle. It'll allow the liquid to come out. I usually recommend letting the liquid come all the way out of the top. Once it starts to come out of the top of the bottle, pull it up. It'll leave a little bit of headspace, which is ideal for your carbonation and then you can immediately put your cap on the bottom. And that's what we got our cap right here for. It's nice and easy. You just put your cap right on the top. Two handles, put it right down on top, and then cinch it down. Now you've got a cap on your beer. It's all ready to go. Um, there are other cappers that are more sophisticated, but most kits will come in with something like this. Um, you really, what's going to happen is the there's little clamps in here that pull the bottle up and push a bell down, which pushes around that cap there. You 
the bottles you use, you want to use ones that don't have a little twist off. That's very common with commercial beer um, because those won't seal properly. You want something that's a pry off. So we've got that in the bottle, all set. It is not ready to drink though. There's no carbonation in it yet. Um, what you're going to want to do is take those bottles, leave them at a room temperature place or a little bit warmer. Um, you want that yeast that's left behind to take that sugar and produce carbonation. So you're going to need about a week to two weeks for that to happen at room temperature. If you notice that your bottles can maybe get a little cold, you want to just warm them back up and give them a little extra time. Um, that carbonation will produce in the bottle. The yeast will settle to the bottom, so you're going to get a little layer of yeast at the bottom of your bottles. Um, you want to, when you actually sample the beer, you want to pour it and kind of decant it off that yeast. Um, nothing wrong with drinking yeast. It's a good source of B12. <laughs> so if you want to, you can swirl it in and drink it. Drink from the bottle however you want to do it. But um, the biggest thing is during that first couple weeks, you want to keep it um, at room temperature. And then you can chill it down, you can store it at room temperature. The biggest thing I would recommend is not letting it get too warm. So don't store it in your garage during the summer or something like that, because that'll help. Any really warm spots will cause the beer to stale over time. So long-term storage, you really just want to keep it in a nice, cool, low-lit space. Light will scump the beer. Um, that's why we use brown bottles, so that it doesn't scump the beer. But if it's in con, you know, in constant light all the time, you're always going to get stuff that comes through. And then pretty much it. Uh, as far as tips, beyond the regular process that I've shown today, um, I think I've kind of admitted this throughout the entire presentation. I recommend you find your process. Home brewing is great as a hobby because you can really define how much you want to do with it, what you care about, what you are willing to make compromises on, whatever makes you make the product you want to make, find that process for yourself. Um, you don't always have to follow what everybody else is doing. Um, as far as equipment goes, I recommend cleaning it right away, like all this equipment that I've used today, I'm going to rinse it off, get it cleaned up, and then anything that has to be sanitized for your next session is ready to go. It's already clean. You don't have to worry about stuff getting crusty or bad things growing on your equipment. Um, I think I stress avoiding oxygen once your alcohol is formed. That will cause staling of your beer, cause oxidation to occur. So nice, gentle transfers of your beer. Use your auto siphon, do things like that. Um, yeast that makes your beer is really your workhorse. Treat them well. Make the temperature nice and stable that they're going to be fermenting at. Give, it, give enough yeast into your beer to produce the, the product you want, and you'll be successful in making good beer. Um, I like to learn from every batch I do. I always am trying new things. I'm also taking notes so they know what to not to do or what to do differently in the future. Um, when you try different spices or flavorings, always start low. It's, it can be surprising how little it takes to develop certain flavors, but you, if you overpower it with a flavoring, it can really make the beer somewhat undrinkable sometimes. Um, so I always recommend starting low and then building up. You can always uh, do another batch where you increase it. And then, as I said before, nothing in, will grow in the wort once it's boiled and that pH has been reduced. So you don't have to worry about, if you get something that starts to taste funky, it is really just a sour beer, it's, or it's something that is going to taste a lot different than what you intended, but it's not going to harm you. So don't worry about um, having to immediately dump it. You can always let it do its thing and see what develops. You never know you might see make something that's really interesting. Um, as far as additional resources, tons of books, information. The library here has a lot of homebrewing books. Um, there's a lot of information online, online forums. You've all got a pamphlet from the American Homebrewers Association. They have a lot of information online. Um, there are brewing magazines that you can get a lot of good information. Um, and then we have our website, scroogeandbarley.com. You go to that website, there's a Brewing 101 link. And in that link, there's a video of all the beginner steps. You can s visualize some of the things that we did tonight and review it if, once you get started with extract brewing. Um, and then we have all the information online as far as uh, beginner kits, things like that. Our shop, I said, once again, is on the other side of the big city, but 
Um, feel free to come up, up there and check out what we've got and we can get you started with, uh, with extract brewing and with home brewing. It's a great, fun hobby that you can give away beer to friends, you can have, make fun things for holidays and for get together, for get together so it's a great thing um, to have uh, as a hobby. So is there any questions anybody has? I know